All right, well, I'm gonna start talking briefly, just so people know we're doing something. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. Um, most times you do a conference like this, and what you do is you end up getting a bunch of venture people together. Come on, guys, come on. You get a bunch of venture people together, and a bunch of venture people talk to a bunch of venture people about venture stuff, right? And occasionally you forget that at some point the business of venture capital is actually buying a security that you hope to sell to somebody later. And so with that in mind, we've invited Quint Slattery to come. And I'm going I'm to read you a little bit of Quint's bio. I actually met him almost 15 years ago when Duncan and I were at a company called Intertrust that went public in the bubble. Um, at the time, Quint was 25, and he owned 10% of the company Intertrust because Pilgrim Baxter, where he was the analyst, was the kind of person you'd go see and sell an IPO into. And that's now what Quint still does at, at Symmetry Peak. Um, he broke significant performance records when he was at Pilgrim Baxter, and his, and his original fund returned almost 1,000%, which is uh, non-trivial in the public markets. Um, and since 2000, Quint has now run a fund out of Pennsylvania, he's my neighbor, about 20 minutes away, uh, called Symmetry Peak. Um, while he can't talk publicly about the performance of the fund, I can say it's pretty eye-popping the kind of numbers he's gotten. And part of the reason his performance is eye-popping is he's one of those few public technology investors who's not afraid to make a big, bold bet. It seems like more and more a lot of the public markets are perceived to be closed because you've got very risk-averse buyers. This is the least risk-averse man you're going to meet all day, and that's following up Mike Maples, who you heard the kinds of things he invests in. And so Quint is going to join us now, and he's going to run through what it would take one of you to potentially get his fund to buy your public offering, and what that means for you in terms of early stage company formation. So is that a good enough intro for you, uh, Mr. Slattery? So, so thanks for coming in from uh, Pennsylvania. Hi. And with that, over to Mr. Slattery. Great. Thanks, Paul. Paul, I think that's the first time you've ever been nice to me. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Thanks, Bambi. This is a terrific forum. I made a little speech here tonight. Thanks for inviting me. This wonderful event. Put this over here. Um, it's great to see the infectious optimism here in Silicon Valley. It's really breathtaking to see the innovation. As Paul said, I invest in the public markets. My name is Quint Slattery, and I'm the founder and chief investment officer of Symmetry Peak Management. Tonight, I'd like to comment on a few key items of the technology IPO market, something that's important to all of us here tonight, and why I believe a few broadly held misconceptions currently are limiting. Let me skip back there, hold on. Um, are currently limiting the historical ability to generate tremendous value. First, let me give you some background on Symmetry Peak so you can have some context for my views. Like the venture capital and private equity participants in the marketplace, our goal at Symmetry Peak is always to invest early in the next technology leaders and ride those investments out to big gains. Yet, unlike the VC and P private equity community, Symmetry Peak invests exclusively, as Paul said, in the public markets. We look at this asset class as a new asset class that we've been pioneering for over 15 years. And we call this long-term public market investing in future tech leaders liquid venture equity, where we take a venture capital and private equity approach to investing, but we maintain the public market benefits and advantages of liquidity, mark-to-market valuations, and transparency. It's a strategy that's worked well for us regardless of the market cycles over the last 15 years. And I've put a lot of my own capital at risk daily in tech stocks. And it's given me a unique window into the technology marketplace. And currently, I have to say that I see three very dysfunctional dynamics at work in the capital markets that are inhibiting more successful IPOs and that are resulting in, or not resulting in longer term wealth creation. As I put here, first, many investors, companies, and advisors seem to have lost faith in the reality that the public markets still remains a terrific platform for scaling great, terrific next-generation companies. Second, increasingly, entrepreneurs and companies and those who back them are failing to recognize that an IPO is an entry into the public markets and not an exit. And third, and I think very importantly, is that there's an unsustainable imbalance between private and public market tech valuations. The good news is that all these dynamics are easily reversible. But part of my goal in raising these issues with you all tonight is to revive the enthusiasm for the public markets as a critically important part of the tech wealth creation ecosystem. Let's take each point here in turn. Point one, 
Many people and advisors seem to have lost faith in the reality that the public markets remains a terrific platform for scaling next generation tech companies. For quite some time now, the buzz in the private tech land, as you all know, is that the IPO market is closed to all but the biggest private companies that are out there. And while this myth's been promulgated, I can tell you it's patently false. There, the IPO market is open for fast-growing technology companies, regardless of size, as long as you're growing really fast. We all know that the IPO market has rough patches. I don't need to tell this audience about the 2000 to 2002 time period. It was pretty rough. Or in my business, from the 2007 to 2008 time period where it was really rough. Um, or the ramifications of the bond market bubble, which we've seen from 2011 till just now. But you know, the thing is about markets is, is markets are up and down, and that's normal. So you should expect that volatility. But the reality is, is that the public markets are simply the best source of scalable, sustainable liquidity that there is. So why the negative buzz? Frankly, I think it's because too many executives are expecting the market to conform to their businesses, rather than adjusting their offerings to conform to the current market conditions. We can get into this more depth during Q&A, but I thought you know, this point brings me to point two right here, which is many entrepreneurs and those who are backing them don't recognize that an IPO coming into the market is an entry, not an exit. IPOs have always been hyped, of course. It's been, the, it's been since the beginning of time. You know, it, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for the markets. It's an exciting time for the company and for the press. And certainly an IPO is a milestone. But the capital markets and those that surround them need to reground themselves about a key reality, which is an IPO is just a financing, and that's it. It's a beginning, not the culmination of a growth cycle. If it isn't recognized as such, the markets aren't being leveraged the right way, and the results are bad for the business and bad for the markets. Think back over the last 20 years in tech, and think of who the iconic tech figures are today. They're very different companies, as you all know. But in terms of their IPOs, they all had the same th things in common. There were three characteristics. They all came public relatively early in their life cycle. They didn't look at the IPO as a dumping ground to offload their ownership stakes. They successfully used the public markets to continually take risks and risks that created very big gains. If executed properly, an IPO results in sustained access to cheaper capital. And a market can be, uh, can be a tremendous ally if the symbiotic relationship is embraced. As you all know, in the 1990s, there were great examples of this. There was Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, Broadcom, Veritas, Siebel, Oracle, EMC, eBay, and Amazon. They all came public early in their life cycles with groundbreaking technologies and terrific management teams, and they set out to change the world, which they in fact did. Their IPOs were just a stepping stone to future success, and their management teams took their roles as stewards very seriously, and they created a ton of shareholder value, and they shared the bulk of their growth with the public markets, which in turn rewarded them handsomely. These companies, for the most part, went public at reasonable valuations. If it, if it was really true that indeed the IPO markets closed, we wouldn't see, as we in fact are, that ne the next generation companies that are emerging today, they wouldn't be coming public, but they are. A few have been astute enough to understand that the markets can be their allies and have built their offerings accordingly. I'm talking about the likes of a Salesforce.com, a LinkedIn, a Netflix, Data Domain, 3PAR, ArcSight, NetLogic, Navtech, SunPower, and Tesla, to name a few. But it's unfortunate that more have not adopted this approach because the reality is, as you all know, is that many of these companies and many of the ones that are being created today require much less private market financing due to the operating efficiencies and scalability of the cloud and the, and the build out of the cloud application cycle. The current technology cycle not only requires much less upfront capital to get the scale, but the mature operating margins of this tech cycle, in many cases, is almost double that of the profitability profile of the tech cycle in the 1990s, which makes it very exciting for us. So what's this mean? There's tremendous upside for companies and markets as long as everyone remembers that an IPO is just a financing, which brings me to point three, that there's an unsustainable imbalance between private market valuations and public market valuations. As a Star Wars fans might say, there's a disturbance in the force. The reason I'm hesitant to personally invest in all but a few select angel or the occasional A round deals is private valuations are here, right up here, and public valuations are down here for the most part. And this phenomenon has been terrific for me in that we've been, 
you know, buying all these great companies in the public market at 50 to 75% discounts to the last funding rounds. In some cases, I'm buying stocks where they're next to the B round financing because the much type IPO blooms coming off these companies and the stocks sink without support and the valuations become great for people like me who buy them up and then they go up over m many years. But the problem is, is that I've noticed this particularly worrisome trend in the Valley where companies are coming public much later in the growth cycle at a time when the pre-IPO hype is at full blast combined with massive deceleration and all the insiders are cashing out without a second thought to how reckless this is to the very difficult and delicate technology ecosystem. And it is an ecosystem. It just doesn't work without the public markets. It's almost as if at times that people are trying to scale their businesses without accessing the public markets until the last possible moment. Some build this as a more mature approach to running companies and as having the benefit of less risk for their investors. I think that conclusion is one-dimensional thinking and it's hurting great private companies and their investors and ultimately the capital markets. With the right vision and a reasonable offering that is well articulated, the public markets can embrace a business and support high valuations. Just look at the progression of Amazon to see that. Worse, this practice of going public late runs in direct violation to what technology investing has been all about over multiple decades. And it's caused a negative bias towards the IPO market by public players. So how do we rectify this? I think the answer is twofold. First, I think companies should come public again early in their life cycles. My advice to people that want to do this, have some long-term vision and have the discipline to communicate it well with the markets and execute it. And most importantly, don't hoard your growth. Second, after sitting in my seat for almost two decades and growing this belly here, um, I've seen an archetype for a successful IPO. And it's really a template, and I've tried to synthesize it right, he right here in five simple steps, most of which you already know. But if you do this, and you f if the banker tells you that you can't come public, call me, I'll take down your whole offering, because your company can come public at any time. First, your company must be the pioneer, as you know, in, the, in its market. And it's got to be the leader. It's got to be growing fast, dislocating a new or existing market with a huge total addressable market opportunity, and you have to express to Wall Street how you're a platform company. Secondly, you must have a strong and deep management team that's passionate in its pursuit to win. You have to want to win. And more importantly, you've got to have, ideally, one strategic visionary to run the company. Thirdly, revenue growth should be in excess of 30%, ideally accelerating, even in a stilted economic environment like today. Fourth, you don't need to be profitable on your IPO. It certainly helps to be profitable on your IPO, but you have to have a path to profitability within one to four quarters. Further, be clear with Wall Street what your mature operating margins look like and your mature model looks like and how long it will take to get you there and at what revenue run rate. And fifth, give Wall Street a three to five year vision of where you're going strategically. They can be a great ally. I hope these thoughts were helpful to you guys tonight and thanks for letting me share them with you tonight. It's extraordinary to see the infectious optimism here, and I just hope that it can translate back to the public capital markets. If we have time, maybe we could do some Q&A. Right. Actually, I, <laughs> actually, I, I don't, I, uh, Quint, uh, I think we have, we'll have time to do one question. Somebody got, <laughs> somebody got a question for Quint. Quint, question, public market. Chris Law, ask the question. Uh, well, I'm not, you know, legally, it's difficult for me to talk about certain stocks if I'm active in them, but um, <laughs> let's use a hypothetical case. Um, <laughs> wow, that was good. Let's say a, a company that's coming public that's trying to come public at $100 billion, absolutely not. The best growth for a company that is, tr you know, that company specifically 10 years ago would have been great. Five years ago would have been great. And they were decelerating and there was a material S1 you know, change on the IPO where they wrote down their, their, their growth actually. And um, I'll stay away from that, but the point is, is that when you see that deceleration and you, know, you see that valuation at, what was it, 25 times sales, I think, to, to come public when you're decelerating to you know, 30, 40% growth when you had been at hundreds of percent growth. No, I don't think it does, but um, something like Tesla would be a perfect example of, of the perfect model where they came public, they exceeded all expectations in terms of, in terms of getting a profitability. Um, this year, the company, you know, the, the analyst estimates earlier this year were for 
company to barely turn a profit in uh, 2014, and now the street estimates went up to $2 in earnings, and they have 1,700% top line growth. And uh, so how do you value that when it's at 50 times earnings? It's just difficult. Um, so I think that, that you know, if you juxtapose those two names, um, you should get a, a better understanding for how public market people yeah, view it. And I'll say this as I thank Quint. Facebook should have gone public two years before it did. What's happened is, you know, I was reading an article about Larry Ellison's daughter and the trust that they have from, from uh, Oracle. And there's a sentence in the article in Forbes that says, after the stock split 10 times since going public, right? Think about it, that's two to the 10th, right? Is Facebook gonna split 10 times when it goes value, uh, when it goes public at $100 billion? It's not gonna happen. So maybe that company should have gone, billion, uh, gone public at f a $5 billion cap and allowed the public market investor to actually ride it from five to 50 instead of only having the insiders make all that money. And that's literally what happened. Well, the other thing too is the cost of capital is much cheaper when you come public earlier. So I think there's a general misconception that's out there that, um, you know, and, and it's promulgated at times because there's some bigger venture funds out there um, where they say, hey, we, you should take our capital, we understand your business better, but in reality, the cost of capital, if you go, you know, early, or much earlier to an IPO, the cost of capital is much cheaper and you have to give up far less of your company. It's much better for the entrepreneur to come public earlier. All right, with that, Quint, thank you very much for making the trip. I really appreciate it.